All right, well, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. We're going to be looking at verse 11 through 40. Um, Our Connect team's walking down the aisles. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, just lift up your hand, and we would love to get you a copy of the Word of God. There's nothing greater in all the world that you could do than to study God's Word, read God's Word, and not just use it as a coaster at home. We're jumping into a new section within the movement section. We've been studying the book of Acts all year. Pastor Brick did an unbelievable job talking about why cities matter. And this is setting up now our next portion of our journey in the book of Acts. Can you all thank God for Pastor Brick real quick and all that he does for us? Um, Really and truly, like, man, I'm just so thankful to work with such an amazing team that is knocking it out. From Josh to Robert to, I better not, you know, name names, Danny with our revolution ministry across the board. Dadgum, Danny, you've trained them up well, dude. Like, I just need the revolution to follow me around everywhere. Could y'all just follow me around everywhere? Just say the revolution, you're excited all of a sudden. Like you could be a Debbie Downer, but you say revolution, and all of a sudden you, you hear a bunch of crazy talk, all right? But we're excited. Man, God's doing some awesome, awesome things all over. And as we jump in, we talked about why cities matter. Now we're looking at for the city section, where Paul and Silas journey on their second missionary journey. And the Holy Spirit, remember Paul received the Macedonian call. He said, I want to go this way. The Holy Spirit said, nope. So the Holy Spirit sometimes closes doors when you're finding out God's will for your life. Ask for God to close doors as much as you ask for him to open doors, right? So the Holy Spirit closed that door and said, no, you're headed to Macedonia. So we're going to be looking at Philippi, which is the first city that Paul lands at. And this is an unbelievable city. We're also going to be looking at cities along the way. And, and God is just doing something unbelievable. I'm going to share with you at the end of our gathering about um, our new location and uh, that we are going to be worshiping at as a church family. For those of you who don't know, uh, Rock and Bowl is kind of coming to an end at the end of the month. And uh, this will be our seventh move in seven years since we planted this church uh, in me and my wife's living room seven years ago. And uh, so we love moving. You know, our slogan should be, we're a cool church if you can find us. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we are on the move again. And I'm going to share with you some some incredible things. Our team started to pray about, okay, well, what, what should we do? Should we do a sermon series? Should we be doing? No, like the book of Acts, guys. I'm telling you, I couldn't have written this better. So our new location is going to be on August 3rd. On July 27th, I preach about Paul in the city of Corinth. Literally, Paul gets kicked out of one location, and he has to go to another location. (laughs) I couldn't have planned that. Like, I mean, so we're just going to keep plowing, and we're in this for the city section. Now, before we jump into the text, let me share with you some reasons why people live in the city. Maybe some of you guys are here. Maybe you're driving through, whatever else. Pastor Brick talked with us about why cities matter last week and did an incredible job talking about our purpose in the city. Um, Let me share with you some things. And this really comes out of the text that we're going to be walking through in Acts chapter 16. The first thing is this. People live in the city because they're on a spiritual pursuit. They're on a spiritual pursuit. Most people flock into the city, and yes, some people in the name of religion... As you can testify around the world today, people flock to these urban centers to worship God or to worship in whatever form of religion. But I also want you to know what you find in the cities. Let's just talk from a completely unspiritual realm here. People are searching for fulfillment. And they come into the city and because the city provides a whole bunch of different things to try and find that thing. Spiritual pursuit. Number two, Practical need. People live in the city because of practical need. The homeless population in New Orleans is one of the greatest in all the nation. Most people flock here because they can receive a lot more than they could if they were in rural places. Practical need can also be in terms of just some of the things that we like. We know that if you live in the city, you don't have to drive six miles to find the closest grocery store you, you, you don't have to go far in order to, to try and find an event. I mean, there's 7,455 festivals here, okay? I'm sure there's one right now as we're talking. You know, there's t- 
tons and tons of things to do. So we know that there's practical need in a city. Why also do people live in the city? Abundant opportunity. Abundant opportunity. Most of you are in the city of New Orleans because of work, because of your career. And in the city, you have an opportunity because there's such a huge, wide variety of opportunities in work, in your vocation. There's abundant opportunities. Then lastly, and this is going to parallel the text that we're walking through, people live in the city because of major impact. Major impact. The Holy Spirit began to align Paul to these cities because when you reach the city, you impact the world. In the same way, whatever business you're in or whatever else, we've got companies flocking in from all over the world who are coming into the city of New Orleans because this is an incredible urban, global center of influence. If you make a name for yourself in the city, you impact the world. So let's talk over the next five, six, seven weeks about some different cities that Paul jumps in to proclaim the gospel. Because what I'm praying for is that we as Vintage Church would so impact this city for the gospel of Jesus that what would rain out throughout all the world, would be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we look at these different cities, I pray that we would begin to apply a lot of what we learn into our own city, asking for the Lord to multiply his amazing gospel. So let's look at this text together. Acts chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, as we start out. So setting sail from Tville, I've stopped trying to say these words. This is Tville. We made a direct voyage to Sville, and the following day to Neapolis, I can say that word, and from there to Philippi, okay, so this is where we land, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, the Macedonian call. That's what we read last time we were in Acts. It's a Roman colony, and it says that we remained in this city some days. Now, let me show you a map of Paul's second missionary journey. I know it's hard to see. We'll make this available online. But basically, remember the launch pad is the church in Antioch, and the Christians are there, and that's where they sent them out in their first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas, they went different ways. Barnabas went back towards Cyprus. Paul ends up going northwest, and he travels through places like Galatia and Asia, and he comes to Tville right there on the coast. He gets into a boat. He basically, within a day, because of the text that we read up until this point, within a day, he finds himself at Neapolis, which is another port city, and then he tracks another 10 miles inland to a very strategic city called Philippi, called Philippi. Any of you guys enjoying the World Cup? Any any World Cup fans? Man, I can't help it. Like, I'll, I'll just be honest. My wife played college soccer, um, and uh, so I know a little bit about soccer, but I've been getting into the hype, too, and, and it's been pretty awesome watching on TV. You can't avoid it, really. It's in our newspapers, in magazines. It's all over TV, news, everything. I mean, it's talk shows. I mean, you can't avoid it, and, and man, I'm kind of, you know, in the hype. I'm really excited about the first round, and I watched some of the games yesterday, but, but then I start watching and remind myself really quickly, it's soccer. Right, and I know I'm making some of you mad, but it's soccer. I mean, like I've learned really how you watch soccer really well. You record it, and you fast forward until you find out if there's a goal. And then as soon as you see the one, you stop it real quick. You watch, and then you you get back into it. I'm just kidding. Don't hate me. Don't leave. But it's soccer. I mean, good night. It's soccer. And, uh, but it's really cool. My favorite part about watching the World Cup is how the nations have rallied. Don't you all love that? I lo- my favorite part about watching a long soccer game is when they show the crowd. <laughs> like, I just see all these, and, and I can't help it. It's the same way whenever I go to a, a, a game at the Superdome or whatever else. I just can't help but think about what Jesus Christ has called us to be about, which is impacting these people. So how do we reach the world? Very simple. Reach the city. Reach the city. How do we impact the world? It's pretty crazy that football has rallied the world. Do you want to strategically make a dent in this world for the gospel of Jesus? Reach the city. How do you reach the city? 
All right, this is rocket science. Y'all ready for this? This is deep. Reach people. Reach people. I'm a pastor, church planner, get to hang out with other church planners. I'm going to Florida this week and going to be at a conference thing with church planners all over really the globe. And um, I'll just be honest, I'm, I'm so just almost done with, tired of this kind of church plant talk game where we talk more about our cool ministry philosophies and different things. And we've so overcomplicated stuff. It's become like business. It's become more about, you know, oh, this is the best way to disciple people, and here's the five steps and all that. Like, it really, this is pretty simple stuff. Reach people. Reach people. Vintage Church started because of that. My wife and I were blessed by the Lord to be able to lead one of her coworkers to the Lord. She's a massage therapist on Magazine Street. It's awesome being married to a massage therapist. And and that person came to faith in Jesus, and out of a reaction to that, Vintage Church started. Reach people. Here in this amazing passage, we find Paul engaging a city for the gospel of Jesus. And he's not coming in with a cool website and a 501c3 with the state, saying, now we got a church. He's coming in, he's finding people. Because in the cities, you find people. So what I want to do on each one of these weeks where we look at these cities, I want to teach a little bit about what these cities are, who they are, and then I also want to give you one or two things each week about our city. I also want to give you some recommended readings for you to become a learner of New Orleans as God has called you here to live the gospel, love the city, and be the church. So let's talk about the city of Philippi. I've already shared with you this is 10 miles from the city of Neapolis. It's a Roman colony that had become a major influence in this entire area of Macedonia. We also know this about Roman colonies, that it was a military base. So you had a huge military population. This was a major driver of influence, of control, of power. We also know this about Philippi. At this time when Paul was there, there was a very small, if not hardly at all, Jewish population. Remember at this point in time, the Roman government hadn't necessarily distinguished Jew, Gentile, Christian it, it hadn't, the, the movement hadn't grown in that strong of an influence as of this point. It kind of just jumbled all of that together. So what I want you to understand about Philippi, though, because this is important for our contextual understanding of what happens to Paul and, and Silas and Timothy and Luke in this point in time, is, is that right before this story, Emperor Claudius, back in Rome, expelled the Jews from Rome. Thus, all the Roman colonies had kind of done the same thing. There was racism going on. And, and I want you to understand, in the Roman Empire, it wasn't illegal for people to have other religions, but it was illegal for you to proselytize. It was illegal for you to evangelize or for you to try and convert someone, especially if that someone was a Roman citizen. So, Um, That's the city of Philippi. Let me give you some stats about New Orleans really quickly. As of 2012, and and census bureaus and stuff like that, this is a very difficult thing for you to figure out, but this is the most accurate thing in terms of from 2012. The New Orleans metro area, which includes a bunch of different parishes, right now, from 2012, we're about over 1.2 million people in this city, which means there's more. Because we're a growing city, one of the fastest growing cities. Let me share something with you in terms of those stats. Um, That's a 3% increase from 2010, which is amazing. People are flocking in. We're we're still not, we might be close to it now, we're still not where we were pre-Katrina. Pre-Katrina, we're about 1.3 million. So we're right under that, or we're hovering around back to where New Orleans was in pre-Katrina. Um, CityLab.com says this, 
from 2012 to 2013, New Orleans is one of the fastest growing cities comparatively in terms of percentage based upon population. They saw a 2.4% increase in one year. It took a 3% increase from 2010 to 2012, but in one year there was a 2.4% increase, which means roughly for New Orleans about 14,000 people flocked into the city of New Orleans from 2012 to 2013. That's unbelievable for New Orleans. New York City wouldn't even recognize it. But for us, I mean, that's traffic problems. People are flocking into the city, guys. And as I think about that stat, can I encourage you and challenge you to pray one just simple prayer? It's a prayer that I pray every day. Lord Jesus, would you save every person in the city of New Orleans? After Katrina, when I was sitting watching a television, watching the city drown, God confirmed upon my life, upon my wife's life, a call to this city called New Orleans. People thought I was crazy, but I believe with all my heart, we were coming back, we were going to come back stronger, and because there were people here, God was now giving me a burden to reach people. Not plant a church, not climb some sort of success ladder, but to reach people, because I believe with all my heart, You reach the city of New Orleans, you impact the world. You just do. It's a global city. Hanging out with my neighbors yesterday, two of which don't even speak English. Just hanging out. The nations are in our lap. Here's the thing that I I can't prove this to you, but just living here for most of my life, this is what I believe about that stat. If there's roughly over 1.2 million people in this city, I believe that we could be looking at over a million people in this city that don't know Jesus. Let's pray for the city of New Orleans. Let's pray and ask for every person to be saved. I've also been reading a book. Pastor Britt gave me a book on my vacations called The Inevitable City by the former Tulane president, Scott Cowan. It's an incredible book. I highly recommend it to you because he breaks down some pre-Katrina, post-Katrina challenges. He, he teaches you about the makeup of this city. He talks about the racial uh, problems that we have in our city, the educational problems. But he doesn't just state problems. He states some solutions, some good things, some bad things. He also talks about the wealth of young urban professionals who are flocking into our city, who are kind of changing culture, bringing improvements, bringing new businesses. But he talked about how that's a challenge because we don't want to turn into Atlanta. We don't want to turn into, you know, Houston. We don't turn into these other cities that that are around the world. We want to be New Orleans, so we've got to hold to some of the traditional elements of our city and hold to some of those unique elements of our city. It's just an amazing thing. Commit yourself to pray for the city of New Orleans. Let's talk about reaching people in this text. Look with me here in this text. If people live in the city because of spiritual pursuit, I want to challenge you in the first place. Reach the seeker. Who's in this city? We're called to reach people in this city. Reach, first of all, the seeker. Let me show you an example of that in the city of Philippi with Paul. In verse 13 through 15, it says this. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. I think it's so interesting that they had to go outside the city. They say back in history when you studied this that in order for there to be a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, there had to be at least 10 men in order for that to happen. So the Jewish population was very, very small. So these ladies rose up and they went, maybe, I don't know, there were restrictions or whatever, but they went outside to a place by the river when Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke and those were looking for believers or seekers, people searching for God. They'd already been preaching the gospel. Here they're going, they land at this place. And Paul rocks up and he does what Paul does. He starts sharing the scriptures. 
And although these people were seeking after God, they hadn't yet given their life to Jesus. They hadn't been saved by the gospel of Jesus. So this one woman who's in pursuit, seeking after God, this one woman, Lydia, it's so important. In the text it says, the Lord opened her heart. Man doesn't save man. Only Jesus saves. And the Lord opened her heart. She was baptized. Her household was baptized. Get this. The church at Philippi has just begun. Because we don't go to church. We are the church. Paul didn't rock up with a website first. He found a person. He preached the gospel. That person got saved. The church has begun. Let me ask you this. Who are the seekers in this city? We have people all over this city seeking after God. And don't be fooled. Some of you guys that love partying it up. I love partying it up. Love having a good time. Going to festivals, you're hitting the clubs, whatever else. And that person that's filling their life with alcohol, drugs, filling their life with everything from this world, man, they're just on this success ladder climb in this world and all that kind of stuff. Can I just tell you, they're on a spiritual pursuit. They're searching for fulfillment. Don't be deceived. They're not just trying to be cool. They're trying to find fulfillment. That's why you as a Christian, you're called to be salt and light. You're supposed to be a little bit different than them. If they look over at you and you're on Team Jesus and you're doing the same thing as them, you're getting buck wild, and you don't ever, there's no difference between you, there's no saltiness, you've lost your taste, man, you're causing some major damage. Because they're looking at you and saying, why do I want anything different? He wants what I want. Who are the seekers? Who are the people at your workplace, in your neighborhood? Number two. Because of practical need is a thing that everybody in the city is looking for. Number two, reach the hurting. Reach the hurting. Let me show you another story. Verse 16 through 18, it says this. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gained by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the Most High who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul became greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and it came out that very hour. So basically what's happening here is as Paul and Silas are still on mission for Jesus, here comes the enemy. Just believe with all your heart, you're doing something for Jesus, you're a threat to the enemy, he's gonna bring something to you. If you're a water boy, he ain't bringing something to you. If you're in the game, he's bringing something to you. And here the enemy comes, how does the enemy come? By way of a slave girl who's been possessed by a demon, who through this power has the ability to tell the future. Some of you guys are like, man, that's crazy. No, it's true. God's real and so is Satan. Heaven's real, so is hell. There are some supernatural things that can happen under the realm of Satan to deceive people in this world away from God. And here this slave girl, I mean, just unbelievable to think about what maybe this girl has gone through, is being used by people to make money off of this crazy gift. So she rocks up to Paul and Silas, and what does she declare? She declares something that, to be honest, probably the crowd was saying, preach it, girl. Go ahead. In the possession of the demon, this girl yells out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaims to you the way of salvation. But guys, that's how the enemy works. Y'all remember bar Jesus? The enemy will deceive you. Had some Jehovah's Witnesses rock up to my house again. They came back, the same dudes. Had fun with them the first time. They came back for some more. 
And I want you to know, Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. They will say all the right things. Here's a simple problem. In John 1.1, according to their translation, which is whack, their translation called the New World Translation, John 1.1 is a verse that says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Their translation says this, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was a God. And that simple twist speaks to the truth that they do not believe that Jesus is fully God, that he was created by God. Thus, they do not worship the same Jesus as me. They are cults. But yet they'll tell you Jesus is great. This slave girl starts to proclaim and Paul starts to observe, oh, snap, people are going to think that this person is on our team. So they wait for some days, and I believe they wait for some days because Paul is so sympathetic to the reality of this girl who is hurting. And he desires for this girl to be set free from this oppression. Y'all do understand that we have people in New Orleans. I know y'all get mad when the waiter's 15 minutes late with your food. But we have people in New Orleans who are slaves in the French Quarter, who have been slaves their entire lives, who sell their bodies to filthy men who come into our city. But your dinner's late, 15 minutes. And that's what's most important. Here's a slave girl needing to be set free. And Paul rocks up to the demon, not to the slave girl, and says what? Be gone? Nope, don't do that. Don't ever rock up to Satan and say, be gone. He will whoop your tail. You say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave. And immediately set free. So ask this question, who are the hurting in this city? I'm about to share with you in just a few moments, God has given us a location closer to our Light of Hope ministry, which was started by one of our community groups. I believe one of the many reasons why we're called to go to this new location, instead of keep hoarding for ourselves in one location, we're called to go is because he's aligning us closer to that ministry, which is a huge need in our city. There's so many people who are so desperately in need. Who is hurting in this city? Number three, because of the abundant opportunities that you find in the city, let me ask you this. Let me challenge you with this. Reach the worker. Let's read another story. Verse 19 through 34, it says this. But when her owners saw that their hope, was, hope of gain was gone. See, you mess with someone's money, then things get personal. I mean, do your Jesus thing. Like, y'all do understand, like, if in New Orleans a real movement of God hits, and let's just say some businesses have to shut down that are focused upon you partying and getting wasted, you watch how the government will rise up and bring persecution to the church. If, if somehow the church of Jesus Christ became more popular than that Saints football game on Sunday. You watch. So these people who had oppressed this girl, now they're losing money and all oh, snap, we got to do something about it. So it says they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews. They're disturbing our city. No, they're not. They're just messing with your wallet. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off of them, gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison, fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, check this, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Let me just stop there. If this is me, I'm just telling you, I come off as a tough guy. I'm really a sissy. 
Like, if this was me, oh, mama, mama, come get me. Like, I mean, I've just been beat up. I'm naked, right? I'm in a jail cell. Please, Pastor Brick, where are you? You know, like, I'm just, I'm just crying out, where's Robert? Oh, you know, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm needing some help. And these dudes are singing. Sometimes that's the greatest thing to do. There's so much power in praise. Sometimes when I'm just kind of by myself, you, you know, you don't have to come to church to sing to Jesus. I, I like pulling out some oldies, but goodies. Like God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died. To buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. See, Paul and Silas, they weren't showing off here. They were tapping in. When things get a little rough, the work day's unsettling, life in the city's hard, sing. Hopefully you sound better than me. Verse 26, it says, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened. Everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword, about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Why is this so important? Paul understood that miracles that happened in his life were not for him. They were for the advancement of his kingdom. We as men got together yesterday and we studied about Jacob, how Jacob wrestled with God. God changed his name to Israel. You know why God changed his name to Israel? To tell Jacob, which was one awful dude up until this point, that this life is not about you. I am setting you aside. I am raising you up because through you, through your lineage, is coming a Messiah that's gonna save the world. Paul could have easily... Oh, snap, I'm out. But he wanted to see this jailer, this worker, meet Jesus. Some of us in ministry, we can, oh, go, 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 new location, new location. Meanwhile, everybody's sitting here, help, help. Oh, he's busy, help, help. I gotta preach, I gotta preach right now, I gotta preach. I do this ministry right now. I got to do it. And that's how ministers look around all the time. Help. There's workers, guys, everywhere. This is incredible. Check this out. It says, And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembled with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Let me ask you this question. Who are the workers in this city? Most of you are here because of work. Who are the workers in the city that need Jesus? Lastly, because people live in the city for major impact, reach the influencer. Reach the influencer. Check out verse 35 through 40 as this story closes. It says, but when it was day, the magistrate sent police saying, let those men go. 
The magistrates were persons of influence in this society. And it says, And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul does something a little bit unique here. He says to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens. He shows them something that's a big no-no. You don't beat up a Roman citizen without a trial. And it says, they've thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, the people of influence, and now the magistrates were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, the church, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them, and they then departed. Why did Paul at this moment try and rise up with the magistrates? Because Paul knew he was going pretty soon, and he knew he was leaving the church there to grow and thrive, and he knew that if he could influence the magistrates, that this would open up doors of opportunity for gospel proclamation. I've never met Mayor Landrew personally. I've reached out to him a couple times, but I pray that every mayor over the next Hundred years that I'm doing ministry in the city of New Orleans, he and I, she and I, we become good friends. I pray that I can love on them, encourage them, pray for them. God has given me some positions in this city, and I just know it's not for my celebrity status. There's going to be a company here next week that's going to be doing some filming in this worship service. They're coming because they've heard about what's going on with this. So don't be spooked out if there's cameras around. You've got to reach the influencer. My dad is Dr. Billy Graham's pastor. One time he's hanging with him, and they were kind of talking. And, and Dr. Billy Graham, he loves kind of getting updates from my dad about news and current events and history. And so my dad started to share about some things and the, the government. And, and all of a sudden, you know, he shares about this one decision President Obama made. And, and as he shares this decision, President Obama goes, I can't believe he didn't call me and ask for me to pray for him before that decision. My dad's like, oh, no. I've just tattled on the president. So Billy Graham gets one of his staff to bring a phone. He picks up a phone, and within five minutes, he's on the phone with President Obama. My dad is freaking out. Y'all might be like, that's crazy. Go and read history. Dr. Graham has been a friend to every president no matter what belief over the years, has always committed to pray, to love, to encourage, to share Jesus. And President Obama receives from Dr. Graham this. President Obama, I, I, I just heard, my dad's, you know, scared to death. I just heard that you made this decision. I, I thought we were going to try and at least pray about it before I just wanted to pray for you because I pray for you all the time. And I just want you to know I love you. Reach the influencer. Who are the influencers in this city? Some of them are right here in this room. You're influencing in that neighborhood, at that business. Some I can just believe with all my heart. You had plans in coming in to consume on New Orleans and then dip into another city. God's beginning to break your heart. And you're going to rise up and, yes, be a major person of influence in industry and in work and all those other different things, but you're going to be a powerhouse for the gospel. Can I share with you our next moves? How do we, as Vintage Church, reach people. We believe in gospel multiplication. And this is how we describe gospel multiplication. We believe in multiplying our core values of truth, love, community, which is expressed as live the gospel, love the city, be the church, through individuals first, because all of us are the church. We don't go to church. We are the church. Through community groups next, it's really important for us to sit in circles, to have accountability, to roll with the church family, and through gatherings. And what I'm talking to you about are our gathering expressions, and I'm so amped up because we've prayed about this, and God's closed doors, he's opened doors, closed doors. We've landed at a place, August 3rd, we have a month, 
we are not going to be here. We're going to be at a new location. And let me share with you, this is what we are doing. We're calling it Moving On Up, little Jefferson's theme. Our arts team's putting together a little ditty. It's awesome. And moving on up, because we don't believe this is a move. This is not survival. This is not, oh, man, hold on. We believe we are going to be thriving in this, and we believe God is aligning us. Here's a capacity of so much. We're going to be having so much more seats available and different things, but we're going to be breaking up. Instead of two gatherings on Sunday morning, we're going to be four gatherings all day. Some of my friends, they've not been able to worship with us for the last year and a half since we went all under one roof. We used to be multiple locations, but now we're, we're, we, we kind of have only been on Sunday mornings, and I called them immediately saying, we're going to have Sunday nights again, and they almost got fired because they were yelling so, so loud at, at work, but we're so excited. So the first is Vintage Jefferson. It's a place where you guys have come before, our Good Friday gatherings. We've done ministry out there before. Uh, Revolution meets out there and our Vintage Espanol ministry. And we're so amped up and excited about that. But that's going to be at 8.30 and 10.30 on Sunday mornings. And then on Sunday nights, we're going to have our Vintage Orleans location. And I want you to know it's going to be the same thing everywhere. Same preacher, same uh, music leader, same thing. We're going to have kids ministry. That's why we're calling out you guys to come and sign up and be a part of things. God's doing something awesome. And I know for some of you guys, you're like, oh, I'm so hardcore. Orleans, but I love that 830 time slot. Okay, would you all please sacrifice for the kingdom and drive five minutes, literally, <laughs> to the other location because of your 830 time slot, right? And that's not most of y'all, right? Like, Maybe you're just so hardcore about the 1030. I got to, you know, if I don't meet for worship on Sunday mornings, grandma's going to spank me or something. You know, like, I don't, like I, I'm, she's going to get really mad because that's, that's God's hour, you know, or whatever. You know, so we're, we're giving you a whole bunch of options here. Let me show you some pictures real quick. Vintage Jefferson, just go ahead and fly through those. We've got a bunch of different pictures of our location. It's going to be a great, great place. It's right off of Cleary Avenue. And we're going to have banners up starting this week. So you can tell your friends about it, especially those of you who live out in Jefferson. Secondly, here's some pictures of our Orleans location. Let me tell you about this real quick. This is the first Spanish American Baptist Church that was started 70 years ago. It's right on the corner of Felicity and Camp. If you're rolling down Magazine Street, it's where you get closer towards downtown. You kind of pass by District Donuts on your left. That's an awesome place. And then Juan's Flying Burrito. And then you go to High Volt Coffee. And then you come and, and man, this is an incredible, incredible partnership that God has brought to us. This church family two years ago is predominantly Spanish speaking, began convicted in their hearts. They started this 70 years ago and their team started praying a year and a half, two years ago, for God to start to send someone that's doing primarily English-speaking ministry because they realized that they were in a neighborhood where there's mainly English-speaking people, mainly young. And God has formed this partnership. Can I just share with you, one of their top leaders said this to me, Rob, we do not want to talk about any money. No money. And I said, serious, like, you know, y'all know us. We're going to bless them. We're going to find a way to pour into them. No money. He said, because if we put money into this, we're an owner. You're a tenant. We don't want to operate like this. We want to operate like brothers and sisters. We want to operate with partnership. I've already gone to the bar right next door, Half Moon Bar. Y'all know I'm crazy. I just rocked up in it, met the manager. Her name's Tammy. She's got, you know, some, some really cool things going on. But I said, yo, what, like, what's, what's going on with this church? Y'all friends with this church? What's happening? And she said, ah, oh, you know, they always tell us to turn the music down. So I said, all right, put this on your calendar for your bar. Throw a big party on August 3rd around 4 and 6, and let's have a competition. Let's see who's loudest. And she's all about it because we're called to reach Half Moon Bar. So I'm so excited. Here's the property, guys. Um, God's going to do some amazing things and what's so amazing as well is God has brought within our hearts a calling to also launch a Spanish-speaking ministry under Jason Priddle's leadership with Vintage Espanol. And Jason and I were out there this past week ministering to them, preaching. I preached and Jason translated. And, man, it was just a sweet, sweet time of friendship. They're going to have an international day on July 
sometime in July celebrating their 70 years of ministry. We're going to ask for you guys to come on out. The food will be off the hook, I promise you. It'll be some authentic Cuban, South American food. It's going to be awesome, okay? So listen, God is doing something. When you reach the city, you impact the world.